<clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to Keys to the Kingdom. I'm Marissa and um, today we're going to do a little introduction into the Greek and Hebrew mindset. I hope you can see this back here, but I'm going to be writing a few notes down just so you can visualize what we're talking about. And um, I want to say a few things before we start giving examples, because um, this is just going to be an introduction. We're just going to touch on uh, a few examples between the Hebrew mindset and the Greek mindset. And then we're just going to touch on a little bit of history so that you just get the um, brief introduction of both of these things to see how um, we are in a Greek mindset today and how the scriptures were written uh, from the beginning from a Hebrew mindset and what that looks like and how that is different, okay? Um, before we get started uh, with a couple of things here, um, I kind of wanted to dedicate this discussion today to a teacher whose name is Brad Scott. Um, he was one of the best Hebrew linguistic teachers probably of our day and who loved Yeshua as the Messiah. And he actually passed this month from his battle with brain cancer. And um, if any of you are interested and would like to support his ministry or his, you know, and his wife and his family, I'm going to leave a link in the teaching of, of this video uh, where you can go and purchase any like videos and books that he wrote and created. Um, he has a wealth of information on his website and his teachings are foundational for everything that I've learned and everything that is, um, uh, what we're going, re having to do with what we're going to talk about today um, regarding Hebrew mindset and Greek mindset versus Greek mindset. Uh, so I'll leave that link in, in this video. If you feel like you're interested in any of his videos, his teachings, he has them on video format and his books, please visit his website. Um, I believe his wife is still running the ministry and the website since his passing this month and um, he's just a wealth of knowledge and information and I would love to um, sort of dedicate this discussion today to him in his honor and in his memory so that his teachings um, continue, which I'm sure they will because so many people were blessed by him and blessed by his teachings. Um, I have no doubt that they will continue to go on. Um, I kind of want to start the discussion today by asking you a question. And it, I'm kind of posing this question to Americans, but this could apply to anybody living in a sovereign country. Um, but speaking as an American, I'm kind of posing this question to Americans if you live here in America. And I want to ask you, what, how do you feel and what are your thoughts and your, your um, what is your standpoint when we have someone who immigrates from another country into this country? If someone immigrates, so here's my question. If someone immigrates from another country into the United States, do you believe that they should number one learn english or learn some english and number two do you believe that they should um you know learn the pledge of allegiance learn about our constitution do you believe that um immigrants from other countries should learn english and learn about our constitution and you know the Pledge of Allegiance and things that have to do with our culture and our, our country. And I'm posing that question to you today because I want to use that same mindset. My, my assumption is, is that if you're an American, you're going to say yes. They should learn some English if they come to this country. If, a, if an immigrant migrates to this country, they should learn the language of our country 
or at least some of it, and that they should know our Constitution, that they should learn, um, you know, things about America that make America or the United States the United States. I'm going to assume that you're going to say yes, that you agree that those are some things that should be done for someone who's immigrating to this country. Let's take that same premise and that same mindset and apply it to the nations being grafted into Israel. So if we think as Americans that immigrants should come here and learn some English, because that's what we speak here mostly, and that they should learn our Constitution and things that have to do with the United States, if they should um, love the land that they're living in, can we apply that same concept to the nations being grafted into Israel? Because we know that Romans says that the Gentiles were being grafted in to the commonwealth of Israel. Should we take those same precepts and apply it to the Bible as well, where you have unbelievers being grafted into Israel, to the nation of Israel, do you think that those nations that are being grafted into Israel should know something about Israel? Should they learn any of the language that was originally spoken? And should they learn any of its constitutions? Um, I'm going to say yes on my part, and I'm going to assume that you would agree that that would be a wise thing to do if you're a foreign nation being grafted in. To a different nation and I want to want I want to make something clear before we start getting into the history a little bit of history and examples is when I say or when we say Greek mindset we're not speaking of Greeks Greek people from the nation of Greece when someone says a Greek mindset um, it has to do with a culture and philosophy that spread throughout the an almost entire known world then because Alexander the Great, just to give you a little bit of history, um, basically spread this, you know, empire over almost all of the then known world. And this was a, a language and a culture that was ingrained in these countries that were uh, conquered by this empire. And then, of course, this is carried over into the Roman Empire, which was then carried over into other empires thereafter in Europe, and leading up to today in the United States and in America, we still carry that Roman, Greek, philosophy, culture, and language today and so when we say Greek mindset, we're not saying like a person from Greece, from the country of Greece. We're talking about a philosophy, a language, and a culture that spread almost all over the entire uh, then known world, but mostly in Europe, and has carried over into our American culture today. And so we, when we say this Greek mindset and this Greek way of thinking, it's a way of thinking, and it's also linked to the language. Um... So we still maintain these concepts and this Greek mindset up to this moment in America today. Um, so let's, um, let's go ahead and get started. Hold on one second. I'm sorry, I think the lighting in here is a little bit shadowy, but I, I hope you'll be able to see this. Okay, so many people don't realize this, but the Bible is Hebrew from cover to cover. And the New Testament imported all of its ideas from the Old Testament. And through, um, and though it was written in Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek, the Bible has a thoroughly Hebrew um, tone all throughout the entirety of the Bible. And some scholars even say that the Gospels were at least written in Aramaic because we know that during Yeshua's day they were speaking a, a form of Hebrew which was called Aramaic. 
But don't let the different languages confuse you. The New Testament writers delivered concepts from the Old Testament to a Greek-speaking world. Because at the time that the Newer Testament was written, people, uh, well, that whole area, the whole Middle East, was, had been conquered first by Greece and then by Rome. So this Greek mindset and this Greek language had permeated the entire area surrounding Israel. And where was I? <laughs> so the New Testament writers delivered concepts from the Old Testament to a Greek speaking world, choosing Greek words to accurately represent Hebrew notions. Much as today's translators search for words in their languages to faithfully portray the Greek. So to understand the Newer Testament, then we have to slip into the Hebrew shoes, so to speak, of its writers and walk with them through the text. This isn't easy sometimes for people in the West because we're strongly influenced by Greek thinking. And we tend to view the Bible through Greek eyes. Not only do Westerners misunderstand Hebrew thinking, but we also incorrectly assume that the New Testament writers attached Greek notions to what they derived from the Older Testament. So some even imagine that Greek thinking trumps earlier Hebrew thought because they reason that the Newer Testament reveals more advanced truth than the Older Testament. In point of fact, the Old Testament blossoms in the Newer Testament through Greek and Hebrew culture. I'm sorry. Though, ge though Greek and Hebrew culture can't coexist any more than matter and antimatter or water and oil, in other words, Greek and Hebrew culture, they don't fit together. They don't jive together. So when we're interpreting the scriptures, we can't mix a thoroughly Hebrew um, scripture through the lens of a Greek mindset. So let's just give a couple of examples here. Greeks will describe objects in relation to the way that they look. So they're looking at the way... Greeks are looking and describing things in the way that they look, while Hebrews describe objects in relation to the way that they work or function. So Hebrews will describe things in the way that they are working or functioning, and Greeks will describe things in the way that they look. Okay? For example... Um, Hebrews would use a verb like to write in order to describe a pencil, while a Greek would use adjectives like the pencil is yellow, it is long, um, to describe a pencil. So in other words, Hebrews would look at a pencil and say, it's something that writes. And the Greek mindset would say, it's long, it's yellow, it has an eraser on it basically looking at the form of it. That's the Greek, the Greek mindset. Uh, another example would be, Greeks describe objects in relation to the objects themselves, while Hebrews describe objects in relation to Hebrews themselves. So a Greek would say, uh, by way of illustration, God is love. We've all heard that, God is love. Uh, but a Hebrew would just say something like, God loves me, describing God in relation to himself. Another example would be, Greek nouns refer to people, places, and things. We know that because we learned that in our English class probably growing up. Nouns are people, places, and things. While Hebrew nouns refer to the actions of people, places, and things. So a Greek would like call parents father or mother, while in Hebrew thought, um, would refer to father as the one who gives strength to the family, and the mother they would describe as being the one that binds the family together. 
the Greeks view the world abstractly, very abstract and kind of like up here in the, in the space. Through the mind, while Hebrews view the world concretely, grounded and concretely through, the lens, through these Hebrew lenses. For example, the Greek word for anger simply means to make angry. While the Hebrew word for anger literally means to breathe hard with flared nostrils, or you'll see it linked to the root word nose. So when you translate that, you can't translate anger as nose because then you would be very confused as to what that means. But in Hebrew, it means to breathe hard with flared nostrils. So let's see here. So taking the same line of argument further, abstract Greeks are more logical. So Greeks would be logical. While Hebrews are more literal. Okay, so Greeks are more logical and Hebrews are more literal. So instead of relying on reasoning to connect actions, events, or ideas, Hebrews will tell it like it is. They like to open with a summary and then give the details starting with square one. This explains why Moses first summarizes the creation story, like in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then he goes on and gives a detailed account of what happened. Greek thinking scholars will mistake this overlap for a gap between these verses. Let's uh, let's go on to let's let's dive in and kind of give more examples to make this um, more clear in your mind of what we're talking about here. Hebrew thinking and Greek thinking are not the same. Yet it is the Greek thinking that influences today's society and impacts many of our English translations of the Bible. So that's kind of important because this is. This is language that we're talking about. And this is what's going to convey to us what it means. <clears throat> the Greek concept of truth can be divided into two parts. In the Hebrew world, reality is the word. For the Greek, reality is the thing. So allow me to explain and give you an example with the Hebrew word Shema. I don't know if you've heard of this word before, and I hope you can see this here. S-H-E-M-A. Shema. Let me bring it a little bit closer. Okay. So the Hebrew word Shema is interpreted in Greek as listen, hear, or obey. And it actually means both, and it means much more. Hold on one second, I think I lost something. The Hebrew word Shema does not just mean to listen, to hear, and to obey. The Hebrew Shema involves having an ear to hear. You'll remember in the Bible how it says, if you have an ear, listen to, you know, how Yeshua says, let him who has an ear hear what I'm saying, what the Spirit is saying. The word Shema means more than just listen and hear and obey. It means to listen and pay full attention as if your life depended on it. And once you've paid attention and heard what is said, begin immediately to incorporate what has been said into your life and adapt every aspect of your thought life, speech, and conduct to what you have heard and begin to memorize and teach it to your children, demonstrate it to the world, until you and the world around you is transformed into the image of the words that you hear. It means doing whatever he says and not doing whatever he instructs against. And doing this 
not to win his favor, but out of a mixture of awe and passionate love of him and in full faith. Let me give you a couple of other examples. So, um, Hebraic thought is different from Western thought as a snapshot of you is different from a full-length movie of your life, even from the moment of your conception to your death. A Western viewpoint has a snapshot mentality. He looks at a moment, and whatever appears before his eyes or catches his, the attention of his ears, at that specific moment, it is a snapshot and considers it to be reality, whereas he Hebraic thought will look at things over the full length of time. I hope you're I hope you can follow with me because we're gonna get we're gonna get it's gonna get better as we go along, but we're just we're just scratching the surface first as an introduction and then we'll go a little bit deeper. The most important senses in Hebrew is hearing and feeling, creating a dynamic intensity and a mood or feeling. This is what we expect when we read the Hebrew scriptures. For the Greek, it is sight. This creates visible things or images, and these images have form and objectivity. Um, in the Hebrew culture, there is only one God, one source, one measuring stick, creating a foundation for moral behavior, um, producing clear right and wrong. In the Greek culture, they have many gods, and this makes right and wrong very unclear. Today, it's called relativism. Like, whatever is relative to you is what is considered right or wrong. Where in Hebrew thought, God is the standard, his word is the standard for what is right and wrong. Uh, and in Hebrew thinking, God does not change. Although he works in cycles, he doesn't change. So, when it comes to time, the, Greeks, the Greek mindset, or the Western mindset, measures time from, you know, just like we do today, from midnight to midnight. And the days of the week are named after pagan gods. We can see this through all of the days of our week as of today were named after pagan gods. In the Hebrew mindset and biblically, the days are separated from sunset to sunset. This was how you measured time biblically from sunset. Let, let me write this down for you. So this is from sunset to sunset. And the Greek way of measuring time is from midnight To midnight. Okay? I hope you're following along with me. So there's a difference in, in, in there's a difference in several things of how the Western mindset measures things and looks at things and speaks of things versus the Hebrew mindset and biblical mindset. Um, so let's just get into some very contrasting examples between Western Greek, you know, approaches and mindsets and the Hebrew. So the Western mindset will look at things this way. Life is analyzed in precise categories, where in a Hebrew mindset, everything blurs into everything else. In the Western Greek mindset, a split, there's a split between the natural and the supernatural, whereas in the Hebrew mindset, supernatural affects everything. They believe that the supernatural is infused into the natural. The, into the natural. In Hebrew mindset, I'm sorry, in Greek mindset, in Greek Western mindset, there's a linear, logic is linear, and in Hebrew, it's a contextual or block logic, and I'll go into that more later. Okay, I just want to get through these. In the Western mindset, and we can very much attest to this being true over here in America, they believe in 
individualism. Whereas in Hebrew mindset, uh, it's very important to be a part of a group. So it's very different, and I'm sure most of us realize this living in the West, in the United States, um, that most of us are, the, you know, it's individualism. It's being very independent. Whereas in Hebrew, it's important to be a part of a group. It's very much family oriented and extended family oriented and that sort of thing. Um, let's see here. Greek mindset believes in freedom orientation and the Hebrew mindset believes in security orientation. And what I mean by security means uh, your family, your, your, your relationship with God, that sort of thing. The Greek mindset believes that competition is good. The Hebrew mindset believes that competition is viewed as a, as a negative. Uh, cooperation is more better. Um, the Greek mindset, man is the center of the universe. In a Hebrew mindset, God and your tribe and your family is the center of the universe. Um, in the Greek Western mindset, a, person is, a person's worth is based on money and material possessions and power. Whereas in a Hebrew mindset, a person's worth is derived from family relationships and their relationship with God. Um, let's see, I want to give you a few more. So the Greek, Hebrew, Western mindset, man rules nature through understanding and applying laws of science, which we see today, especially when it comes to... Um, you know, the teachings that they're teaching a lot of people today regarding evolution. And the Hebrew mindset, God rules everything, so relationship with God determines how things are going to turn out. Whereas the Greek mindset, they're thinking, man rules nature through understanding and applying laws of science. Basically, that we can control nature and our destiny uh, through science. Western mindset believes that power over others achieved through business, politics, and human organizations, whereas the Hebrew mindset believes that power over others is structured by social patterns ordained by God. There is a social structure in God's kingdom, but it's ordained by God. Um, so this one's important. I hope you'll pay attention to this one. The Greek mindset is linear in time. So they view, and in, in, I'm sure, you know, we, we learned this in school, that time is measured on a line. And there's different points on the timeline. And this is going to be B.C. And this is going to be A.D. So the Greek and Western mindset is viewing time as a line. Okay, so from this is the past. And this is the future, future going this way, okay? Whereas the Hebrew mindset and the Bible is very cyclical, okay? Everything is a circle. So you can actually see it as a circle within a circle within a circle within a circle. Um, but time is, is, is in patterns, it's a spiral of patterns. And we will see this, um, we'll see this in God's feast days. We'll see this in his Shabbats. We'll see this in all of his appointed days happening year after year after year after year in similar events constantly reoccurring during these times. Whereas Greek mindset just sees things on a line. And of course, you know, we divide our timelines uh, between, you know, before Christ and after death. Um, I'm going to give you a few more examples. Greek mindset is going to view change as something that's good. You, you know, today, especially in America, people are talking about being progressive. We're constantly changing and always evolving towards something better, better than what we already are, right? We're just, we're constantly progressing. That's why you hear that. That term being used today, progressivism. Hebrew mindset views change as kind of a negative because it's a destruction of godly traditions. Not traditions of man, but godly traditions. 
because in a Greek mindset, you can't stay where you are. You can't, things have to keep progressing. They have to keep being moving forward and we have to be changing and evolving. There's a big difference there. Uh, in a Greek mindset, the universe evolved by chance, as we see in evolution. And in the Hebrew mindset, the universe was created by God. I think we can all agree on that. Um, a Greek mindset, the universe is dominated and controlled by science and technology through man. Whereas in a Hebrew mindset, God gave man stewardship over his earthly creation. We were supposed to be stewards over the world. Um, here's just a couple of more, a, a couple more examples. In a Greek mindset, material goods equal a measure of a pers person's personal achievement by material goods. This is how we measure someone's personal achievement is by material goods that they have collected. Whereas in a Hebrew mindset, material goods are a measure of God's blessing. Okay. Uh, and a Greek mindset would look at faith as like more of a blind faith, whereas a Hebrew mindset is a knowledge-based faith. Um, Hebrew is more concerned with practice. I'm just going to erase this. And I'm going to tell you right now, I realize that my teaching skills aren't going to be anything compared to Brad's. He's funny and he's so smart and he just knows how to deliver it to you. But I'm hoping that we can, like I said, just kind of scratch the surface and give you an introduction to the difference between the Hebrew mindset and the Greek mindset. Okay, so bear with me. I know it's a little bit of a class today, but I'm hoping that you'll stick with me so that we can kind of see these differences. So the Hebrew is concerned with practice. Whereas the Greek is concerned with knowledge. So the Hebrew is concerned more of what you do, and the Hebrew is more concerned with what you know, okay? To the Hebrew, it's more about right conduct, okay? That's the ultimate concern, is how are you conducting yourself? The Greek... So the Hebrew is concerned more of conduct. Okay. I hope you can see this. I know it's kind of far away. Um, hold on a second. I'm going to turn you this way. Okay. So the Hebrew is more concerned with practice and conduct, and the Greek is more concerned with knowledge, okay, and right thinking. The Hebrew is concerned with right conduct, and the Greek's more concerned with right thinking. But which is more important, what you think or what you do? Okay. Um, I don't want to get too long-winded here. I, I just want to hit all the all the main points. Let's get into a little bit of a history. This is going to be a little bit of a history lesson. Okay. Where did Greek thinking or this Greek mindset, where, where was it born? Okay. Well, we can go back to Greece and say that it kind of started there with, let's say, Plato, who, um, who actually created the model for the university that we still use for the modern universities that we have today. Um, then we have Aristotle, who redirected the thinking of Plato. So all of this had to do with, remember, during this time, during the Greek um, uh, empire, it all had to do with philosophy and how a man thought, okay? So you have Aristotle, um, that was reforming and redirecting the thinking of Plato and teaching that the forms and ideas are not found in some abstract realm, but in the particulars themselves. And he says, um, 
let's well let's let's give an example here aristotle created systems of logical argument and he taught that truth was discovered by systematic arguments based on the premise and conclusion and aristotle was the teacher to alexander the great and alexander the great conquered the known world then and spread this empire okay and he spread this thinking all over this way of thinking and his alexander's strategy for greece was to dominate the world by conforming the world to greek thinking conforming the world to greek thinking and this was done through language this is why language is important and this is why we're even having this discussion today because language is very important and we're, we're going to see why a little bit later um well alexander the great knew that if you change a people's language so so when they went and dominated a country they didn't just dominate them and overtake them they changed a people's language because when you change a language you change the whole view of life okay language shapes and molds and defines a culture okay hate can turn into loyalty if you change the meaning and purpose of the words and traditions i'm pretty sure we can see a lot of examples of this today as words and meanings are being twisted and misused we use a lot of words today that have nothing to do with what they actually used to mean and we use words today very free freely and depending on how you interpret those words they can be interpreted very different ways especially in this world of 2020. um so what did Alex, what did alexander the great do he educated his future leaders in greek letters and weapon weaponry he established schools throughout his conquered region schooling was very important when he was conquering these other nations okay he organized traditional greek festivals to honor gods in the most lavish fashion he trained his successors in the greek language and I want to note, make a note here that our English language is very much rooted in Latin and Greek. So just bear, keep that in mind. He taught that the deities made their wishes known through natural phenomena, through omens and oracles, which were interpreted through great speakers in the theaters and arenas. And this is why Paul and Barnabas were called Zeus, uh, Jupiter, Mercury. Um, they, they were calling them all of these names uh because these were the roman names for the greek gods at that time and although rome conquered greece they took upon the same systems of philosophy only the names were changed a little bit so so just consider this most of western thought which we have here in the united states includes ideas about language and logic natural science mathematics ethics politics theology all draws from this greek tradition okay keep that in mind let's continue with a little bit of history here okay so during the second and this is going to be this is going to be a history lesson you gotta you gotta pay attention i know it's uh some some of you aren't used to this but um, bear with me because it's important during the second and third centuries Hellenism okay remember that word remember the word Hellenism we're gonna put it under Greek here because that's where it came from Hellenism and the perpetuation of the Greek language quickly dominated the entire Western world. Okay? I'm very sorry about the lighting. The Macedonian kings from Greece took their Egyptian influence culture back to Egypt through the Ptolemy family around 260 BC. 
and the language and thought process of Greek had so changed the Eastern culture that King Ptolemy put forth the decree to translate the entire Hebrew Bible into Greek. Okay? This was later known as the Septuagint. I'm sure you've heard of the Septuagint, translation of the scriptures. The Septuagint was so named allegedly because it was accomplished by 70 scholars, Septuagint meaning 70, um, but there is some, there's a little uncertainty about that, but they're, they're thinking that's where the name Septuagint came from. But anyways, uh, Yeshua quoted from it quite often. This version of the scriptures is one of the most uh, amazing pieces of evidence of the reliability of it itself. Virtually every scriptural and secular scholar agrees that the scriptures, with the exception of Esther, were translated from Hebrew to Greek in or around 250 years before the birth of Yeshua. Okay? So they're saying that 250 years before Yeshua, the scriptures were translated from Hebrew to Greek. Because before Yeshua's time, which, when, which was when the Romans were ruling, uh, prior to that was the Greek Empire. Okay. So this means that the 333 prophetic utterances of Yeshua's birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection are at the very least written 250 years before they happened based on the oldest scripture that we have. So one by one, the generals of Alexander began to fall to the Roman Empire. So the Greek Empire and all of its philosophy and ideas and ways of thinking were taken over by the Roman Empire. And Philip IV of that empire began to decline by challenging Rome and by challenging Rome. Um, and then this new dynasty was still going strong by 163 BC when Antiochus IV ruled Jerusalem. Antiochus, as did his predecessors, carried the Greek Egyptian traditions and culture into his reign. The Book of Maccabees, I hope you've heard of the book, I'm sure you've heard of the Book of Maccabees. Um, it's in the Apocrypha and it's also where we get the story of Hanukkah. But in the books of the Maccabees record much of this period of Greek history, especially as it permeates the Hebrew culture. The story of Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication, is the best example to date of how scriptural thinking and culture can be dramatically altered. Normally, a change in thinking process occurs very slowly over a long period of time, but the account of the Maccabees happened comparatively quickly. So I'm gonna give you a quote right out of the book of Mac of first maccabees this is actually first maccabees 1 verse 11 through 14. so and this is this is again some history here in those days of antiochus epiphanes lawless men came forth from israel and misled many saying let us go and make a covenant with the gentiles around us for since we separated ourselves from them many evils have come upon us um, and this proposal pleased them, the Greeks, and some of the people eagerly went to the king. He authorized them to observe ordinances of the Gentiles. So here we have the Hebrews, the Israelites, bowing down to the Greeks basically out of fear because bad things were happening. They had conquered Jerusalem. So they were basically giving in. They were giving in to the king of the Greeks. And he ordered and authorized them to observe Greek ordinances of, of, their, of their, uh, their Greek and Gentile ways. So they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem for Greek education, okay, which was according to Gentile custom. This is what they did. They would build a school and they would educate them in their thoughts, in their ways, and in their customs. And this is what the Hebrews did. They removed their marks of circumcision and abandoned the Holy Covenant. And they joined themselves with the Gentiles and sold themselves to do evil. 
So the first thing done in Greek thought is to build an education center and to train captives in Western thinking. To conquer with the sword is basically very temporary and still maintains an enemy. You're just you're maintaining someone who still is not happy with you and is still your enemy. But to conquer the mind and to teach um, and to indoctrinate those that you have conquered starts to create more of a friend and an ally and someone that you can relate to because now you've been indoctrinated. This was how they, this is how the Greeks and the Romans were conquering. If you change the language, remember this, this is very important. If you change the language and you change the meaning of things, for words are only symbols. If you change the symbol, you change the meaning and create a whole new set of parameters of thinking. Paradigm shifts in any society are created over time in gradual increments. This is primarily why people, especially church people, see the instructions of Yahweh, yod heh vav -Heh, as antiquated, obsolete, and almost impossible to grasp. And our whole thinking process has been so far removed from Yahweh that it's almost unrecognizable. Let's, uh, let's continue um, with a little history out of the 1st Maccabees. 1st Maccabees 1, um, verse 41 and 49 through 49. Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people. And I want you to keep this in mind because I want you to think about this when you think of the United Nations. Okay? The king wrote the whole kingdom and said we should all be one people and that each should give up his customs. They're still trying to do this today. There's nothing new under the sun. This is what they were doing back then and this is what they're still trying to do today. That each should give up his customs. What he really meant was for the captives to give up their customs, but not the Greeks to give up their customs. All the Gentiles accepted the command of the king because nothing was going to change for them. Many, even from Israel, gladly adopted his religion, the Greeks' religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and to the cities of Judah, and he directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, and to profane Sabbaths and feasts, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred um, shrines for idols, and to sacrifice swine or pigs and unclean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were convincing them to become Greeks, saying, oh, we should all be one. And they were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane so that they should forget the law and change all the ordinances. This is the perfect description of apostasy. The abandonment of Yahweh's instructions is basically what apostasy is. This will indeed happen again according to Matthew 24, and we'll go into that more later, but many people in Israel at that time gave in to the king and abandoned the covenants and the feasts. These were the forerunners of the Grecians, and over generations these Hebrews mixed Western thought with their own ancestry. But many of these people did not. And thank God for, you know, God always keeping a small remnant who do not succumb to the ways of the nations, the ways of the world. And of course, some of them were executed for their, their trust in Yahweh and for sticking to his ways. And others escaped and followed the Maccabean brothers in the desert to eventually return and take back the temple. And this is, of course, the facts of the Hanukkah story. This is what happened during Hanukkah. And I hope you'll study Hanukkah and I hope you're with me during the Hanukkah season as we, uh, I'll, you know, we'll probably do a discussion on what the Hanukkah story uh, was. It wasn't just, you know, lighting the menorah and it stayed lit, you know, for seven days. There's, there's more behind it. 
The point is, is that Yahweh's way defeated the Western way by standing strong in his words and not giving in to Greek influence. So between the time of Antiochus, Epiphanes, or the time of Hanukkah, and the birth of Yeshua, the Roman Empire had defeated all of the kingdoms of the Macedonian Empire. And Rome's culture is now prevailing at the time of the so-called birth of Christianity. So at the birth of Christianity, uh, Rome's culture, which was basically just a carryover of, of the Grecian culture, had, was prevailing all over the empire. Okay? And, and, and to really get into um, some things here, I'm going to read a couple of chapters out of one of Brad Scott's books. It's called The Principle of the Seed. I hope you can see this here, The Principle of the Seed. This is such a foundational book, and I hope that you will um, be inspired by these first couple of chapters to maybe purchase this book from, the, from their website, which I have linked um, in the video description of this video. Um, th this, is, this is foundational, guys. This is foundational when it comes to really understanding the Word of God and what He is trying to convey, okay? Amen? Just, just, just bear with me here. We're going we're gonna to see a few things. So I'm going to read a few chapters after, out of this book because, uh, I mean, I, 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 can, I, can, I can introduce these things to you. I can introduce uh, what we're talking about today, but nobody can teach it better than Brad Scott. I, I, I'm, I, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think anybody can. I certainly can't. Um, and this is why I'm encouraging you to, to go to his website. Like I said, um, it, it, it is such a loss for the kingdom, his passing this month. He was battling, um, he was battling with brain cancer. And I, I hope that you will be encouraged to still support his ministry and his wife and his family, um, by maybe going to, to the website and, you know, purchasing some of his teachings because they are fundamentally foundational and um, they'll, they'll really open up your mind and get you excited about things and ways of looking at the word that you, that you may not have before. Okay, so um, let's, just, let's just start with chapter one here to give you a taste of what's in this book. Um, chapter one is entitled, Eating from the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil. Okay, and he starts off saying, no one needs to look very far or very hard to see that the moral and ethical and social decline of our once great nation, he's speaking about America, all you have to do is turn on the TV and notice the subjects of the first 15 minutes of every broadcast or take a look at the first three pages of most newspapers. Moral and ethical scandals of every conceivable variety are plaguing this nation. Every other week or so, another powerful politician is in the middle of a political scam, especially when there is money involved. And the more technolog technologically advanced we become, the greater the ingenuity and complexity of our criminal possibility of our criminal possibilities. Not only are the traditional immoral activities skyrocketing, but our imagination has run amok in all the possible combinations of insidious behavior. Most of us can live with this as long as it's not happening in our neighborhood. However, historically, plunging morals and values have preceded the fall of every great nation that once dominated the earth. And these are not insignificant times. Many of our young people today have grown up in a world in which the great nation to the north of Israel, which is Russia, for those of us old enough to, <laughs> he's saying, basically, if you're old enough to receive AARP, uh, that area was called the Soviet Union. And um, there has been a consistent tone in many of their speeches and writings concerning the United States. So he's, he's talking about Russia or the old Soviet Union um, speaking and writing about the United States. The presentations may be different, but the bottom line was always consistent. The United States of America 
is going to fall. This is what Russia has always said about us. America will collapse. We will not send a single missile or a single soldier. She will implode because of her immorality. And we see this today. Here we are today. Americans have been polled quite often concerning their faith. And um, the USA Today has polled us, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and even the Christian um, pollster George Barna have questioned us concerning our faith. Every one of these polls have drawn very similar conclusions and very close statistics concerning America's faith. America has fairly consistently claimed to be Christian and has generally landed in the 90th percentile in our confession of some form of Christianity. So he's saying that America, let me just erase all this. He's saying that America claims to be, America claims to be 90% some form of Christianity. Can you see that? America claims to be some some form of Christianity. 90% of America claims some form of Christianity. Okay? Keep that in the back of your head. In other words, close to nine out of every 10 people on the street claim to embrace some brand of Christian faith. Now, why would a nation that is 90% Christian collapse because of their immorality? And how dare you tell us, Mr. Communist, that America, the land that has God on the dollar bills, is going down because of our immorality? The next time you have an opportunity to read through a modern almanac, you will notice that America leads the world in several interesting categories. America leads the world in the distribution and consumption of pornography. She is number one in illegal drug consumption. Um, but the more startling statistic is that we lead the world in legal drug consumption. I don't know if you know this or not, but every other place in the world, it's illegal to advertise uh, medications, prescription medications. You cannot advertise it on TV. Only in America can we advertise prescription medications on TV to viewers. And this is far more insidious than illegal drug consumption. And why is that? Because many of us unconsciously or consciously assume that if it's legal, it must be all right. Our multitude of ailments is rectified by, by consuming a myriad of legal drugs. And this myriad of legal drugs has become the dominant source of our ailments. And I'm going to suggest, Brad Scott like to always say that. He always said, I would like to suggest to you that our healthcare system and our health are out of control. And I'm going to draw a distinction right now, uh, just to give you an example, between Greek mindset and Hebrew mindset having to do with medicine. So Greeks, the Greek mindset, and the Hebrew mindset, when it comes to medicine or, or treating a patient who someone is sick or has an ailment or a complaint, uh, a physical complaint, the Greek mindset is treat the symptom with medication. So we even have Greek and Hebrew mindset or Western and Eastern mindset operating in our medical community. So the Greek mindset or the Western mindset, and we see this today in America, 
having to do with treating patients is to treat the symptom with medication. A Hebrew mindset in that same medical arena with treating a, uh, a patient is going to treat someone holistically. What does it mean to treat someone holistically? You have to treat the whole person. You have to, this is a major difference and I work in the medical field so this hits very hard for me and I'm very passionate about this, is you have to treat someone's whole body. You know, used to doctors would walk into a room and they would, they would look at you, they would examine you to treat you. And they would, you know, holistically means treating with food or supplements. Today, we would look at this as treating with food or supplements from a Hebrew mindset. In a Greek, sub, Greek mindset, you're treating the symptom and you're treating it with medication. You'll almost never hear your doctor discuss your diet. Almost never. Unless you're diabetic, of course, they're going to say, you know, don't eat sugar or don't eat things that turn to sugar. But for almost all of the other range of ailments, the doctor that you're going to see is going to treat your symptoms, but they're not going to treat you holistically from an Eastern Hebrew mindset, and they're not going to discuss your food consumption, and they're definitely not going to discuss supplements with you, almost never. Unless you have an integrative doctor, they're not going to do that. So I wanted to go ahead and kind of show you the difference that even the Hebrew and Greek mindset are operating in our medical community. All right, so let's get back to, to chapter one here. Um, so with that in mind, now with that in mind, okay, so we are, we are treating symptoms with medication. We lead the world in the distribution of pharmaceutical medications, yet we also lead the world in disease. Not all deadly diseases, although the world, although that could be included, but rather in everyday run-of-the-mill diseases that we have all learned to accept as part of life, like diabetes, thyroid problems, cholesterol problems, uh, heart disease, um, uh, you know, autoimmune issues. We are number one in the world in health costs and health care. We come in first in the world in psychological treatment, drug treatment, mental hospitals, Valium and Prozac. We lead the world in suicide, particularly in the, in the younger generation, you know, under 18. Uh, we're always one of the leaders of the world in murder. Uh, not mass murder, but just killing ourselves off one at a time. We are murder, we are number one in the world in sex crimes, and we lead the world in churches, but yet we lead the world in churches, seminaries, revivals, missionaries, gospel groups, Christian rock stars, and purpose-driven congregations. So what is wrong with this picture? How do we lead the world in all of these diseases, all of these mental issues, all of this prescription drugs, but yet we also lead the world in churches, in congregations, seminaries, revivals, missionaries, Christian rock stars. How, how is this happening? How is all of this happening at the same time? Remember that statistic wherein America confesses to be the 90% Christian, that we, our country confesses to be 90% Christian. Well, the dominant religion in this country, in concert with the media, would have us all believe that the reason we lead the world in all of these immoral activities is because of the 10%. So we're led to believe that it's because of the 10% that are non-Christian. Remember I said that America claims to have 90% people claiming to be some form of Christianity. We're blaming it on the 10% as to why all of these problems are happening in our country. In other words, these people would have us believe that the tail is wagging the dog here, okay? So that the immoral 10% are controlling the moral 90%.
the dominant religion in America would identify for us who the 10% are. They would be the atheists, the agnostics, the homosexuals, the Democrats if you're a Republican, and the Republicans if you're a Democrat. They would include the liberal media, the Hollywood, of course. Many would lay blame entirely to the Clintons or perhaps a few on sports and beer commercials, but never, ever, ever would the faithful 90% be involved. No, of course not. After all, judgment does not start or begin at the house of God, right? I am going to suggest something that may shock many. And I'm going to suggest that the reason our once great country leads the world in these immoral categories is because we indeed are 90% Christian. Let me repeat that. I'm going to suggest that the reason our once great country leads the world in these immoral categories is because we are 90% Christian. Yes, that is what I said, but bear with me. Here is what we are not. We are not 90% God-fearing, Bible-believing, obedient followers of a Jewish Hebrew Messiah. Let me repeat that again. Here is what we are not. We may claim to be 90% Christian, but we are not 90% God-fearing, Bible-believing, obedient followers of Yeshua the Messiah. We are, however, dominantly Christian. We have done a wonderful job of proliferating Christian doctrine and reproducing more Christians. But are we teaching scriptures, all of the scriptures, or are we teaching and spreading Christianity? Is it the scriptures that we are living by, or is it the message of the products of our great seminaries and the early church fathers that we are reproducing? Are we teaching and spreading the scriptures, or are we reproducing great seminaries and the early church fathers? This is the question we want to ask ourselves. And I want to add, and he says here, I want to add that while we lead the world in all of this immoral and evil behavior, our nation has done much good as well, and we are usually one of the first nations to send medical supplies, food, money to nations hit by disasters. We do conquer nations that we are at war with, and we go back and play a major part in restoring that same nation. We do good at one turn and evil at another. Which tree do you think that America is eating from? Which tree in the garden do you think America is eating from? Could it be possible, especially in these last days, that judgment really does begin in the house of God? And should the house of God rise up and take responsibility for restoring the laws of Yahweh, Elohim, back to this great nation? And Brad Scott says here, as a former pastor, if I could be such a thing, I followed the Christian line and I believed, taught, and behaved in the usual cookie-cutter manner and towed the line of dispensational thinking. My sermons were filled with three good points followed by a poem and I closed in the usual manner by presenting an altar call. This was the typical way a pastor was uh, running his congregation. Uh, and he said, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Now and then there would be someone who was moved by what I had said and would come to somewhat reluctantly up to the front of the sanctuary. Of course, he did not know what to say or how to accept Christ into his life. So I had to, for all intents and purposes, do it for him. We all know how that goes. And we have, and we, you know, we have come to church. We all plant ourselves in our usual spots. The service begins with the praise team singing for us. And then the pastor prays for us, followed by a sermon which the pastor has prepared by studying for us. And you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with Greek and mindset? And this has a lot to do with Greek and Hebrew mindset. So Brad goes on to say, the pastor prays for us again, and then we saunter up front to get saved. To get saved. He must now speak for us so God hears the right words. True True to the core.
course, I would then tell this new convert that he should go home and read his scriptures now. So this is what he's saying. As a pastor, he would have them come up front, and once they were saved, he would have them go home and read their scriptures, starting with the book of John. Way back there in the book of John. How many of you, this is a good question, how many of you come home after purchasing a good book and sit down in your favorite chair and open the book and start reading three-fourths the way through the book? We do that with one particular book, however. I have a new suggestion for those who have recently received the Messiah. Go home and read your scriptures and start in the beginning. That way, when you get to the end, you will know who everybody is. You will know the plot and the characters, and you will have a substantially grounded view of the author. So Brad Scott is suggesting not to go home. Do you, do you remember that for, for I, I don't know how long this was going on, but there was only copies of the Newer Testament. They didn't even have the Old Testament attached to the Newer Testament. So people were getting saved and they were starting with the Gospels. How could you possibly understand what, what this means to enter into the kingdom? Maybe you don't even know you're entering into a kingdom. What this means to be saved when you're starting a book towards the end. So Brad goes on to say, I have found that even though my passion and my dedication lie in teaching and understanding this beautiful God-ordained language called Hebrew, the problem in America is not a lack of Hebrew. According to Mr. Barna's poll, once again, most America's, Americans do not know what their scriptures... Most, so what he's saying is, America doesn't need to learn Hebrew. Most Americans don't even know what their scriptures say in English, much less in Greek or Hebrew. Most Americans are familiar with many of the stories contained in the Older Testament, but a large majority could not immediately recall who came first, Moses or Abraham. A large majority of Christian adults could not place in which book many of the stories in the Tanakh were located. There was a significant group of people who were unfamiliar with the names of many of the books in the Tanakh or Older Testament. Could some of this be attributed to the fact that we started most believers in the book of John reading the Newer Testament? Could some of this be traced to a dominant religious system that generally ignored the Tanakh? Because after all, Christ, or the Messiah, died to end all of that. It is this author's opinion that there is a direct relationship between our ignorance and rejection of God's laws and commandments and our leading role in the immoral behavior. Let, let me read that again. Let me stop and read that again. <laughs> Love you. I see you there. Let me read that again. It is this author's opinion, Brad is speaking for himself, he's saying it's my opinion that there is a direct relationship between our ignorance and rejection of God's laws and commandments and our leading role in immoral behavior. We're going to read one more chapter, chapter 2, and then I'm going to end. And um, you're probably going to see this later. I think I accidentally did this video through the event, so I don't think it's showing to anybody. But that's fine. You can, you can see the video later. Um, but I hope you'll check, check this book out, The Principle of the Seed. I'm just reading the first two chapters to kind of give you a taste of it. Um, because nobody can speak better than Brad Scott. I, I, on this subject, he is just the end-all, be-all. God rest his soul. I, I, I pray for him and I pray for his family um, and his ministry it has been such a blessing. Okay, chapter 2. Hebrew, think, Hebrew thinking and Greek thinking. Before drifting too far into our subject is an imperative that we have a cursory view of the difference between Hebrew or scriptural thinking and Greek Western thinking. This is a very long historical background to the thought process that our culture practices and the thought processes of the people of the scriptures. 
Cultures and thought processes are steered by language. Our English language, which springs forth primarily from Greek and Latin, is a very abstract in its thought process. Many of the theological terms in our English Bibles are abstract and linear terms. Abstract is a word used to describe word, words and concepts that have little or no discernible objects. So in other words, terms that have no particular object with which, which, with which to associate the word. So examples of English abstract terms would be faith or believe, love, obey, glorify, fulfill. These are the kind of words that are not wrong in and of themselves, but are very subjective. You know, what is love? I mean, that can be, that's very abstract. You know, what is faith? That's very abstract. It's not very concrete in its, in its description. Hebrew is a very concrete language and thought process. And as we take scriptural words further back to their original environment, to the mountaintop, Brad describes it as back to the mountaintop, and you'll see that in his teachings. Um, theological terms are ultimately defined by natural, physical, and material items or terms. These words find their action-driven background in everything, in everyday things that Hebrew people would have experienced. So he's saying that Hebrew words go back to everyday things that Hebrews would have seen, smelled, touched, sensed, experienced. Let's see here. Um, I want to see how long this is because I don't want to go too far out of time. Okay. So let's give an example in the scriptures of Hebrew of Hebrew terminology or Hebrew concrete words. So like this is from this is from Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who walketh in the way in the counsel of the I'm sorry. Blessed is the man that walks not that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law does he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and brings forth his fruit in season, and his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So as you can see, there's multiple uses of words that come from seeds and natural phenomenon to describe how a man should live. <clears throat> seeds are one of those concrete terms that Yahweh will use to describe how we are brought into the kingdom of God and who his people truly are. That's why the book is called The Principle of the Seed. He's going to start with the seed from the beginning. So our Western culture is also linear in its thinking process compared to, remember we talked about the Hebrew being a cyclical, round, agricultural way of thinking. We are trained in linear thinking, especially in religious matters. Imagine for a moment that I'm your history teacher. So he talks about, remember I put up here the, uh, the timeline. He's going to talk about the timeline, how it goes from past to present. Um... <clears throat> so our dominant religion takes this perception okay let me make this clear our religion takes on the dominant perception into the view of Yahweh and his plan for man so we are taking the Greek mindset of a linear thought process, a linear timeline, remember the timeline was, the timeline was having to do with, ooh, I want to lose my spot. Greek thinking was in a timeline. And this was Messiah in the middle. And Greek thinking 
So we're taking Greek way of thinking in time into our way of believing that's how God works with his ways. But we're going to see that that's, that's not how God works. So our dominant religion takes this perception into its view of Yahweh and his plan for man. Yah's work in this world is seen as an evolutionary process. In the beginning, the people of God needed certain things and were treated and looked upon by their creator differently than the more progressive church. So we see this over here as, you know, um, I hope you can see this. So if this is the timeline, so if this is future and this is the past, okay, we see this as Old Testament. And we see this over here as the New Testament. This is how we've taken Greek thought into our religion. Okay? So Greek thought thinks of things as linear. So we've taken that into our religion and said, so this, this part of the line over here is the past, and this is the Old Testament, and this over here is the future, and this is the New Testament. And this is how we've incorporated Greek thought into our religion. All right, so let's go on. So, in the beginning, the people of God needed certain things and were treated and looked upon by their creator differently than the more progressive church. And so this is the Greek thinking. The Old Testament Jews are analogous to man's great ancestors. Um, hold on. <laughs> so basically what he's saying is in our thought, in our Greek thought processes, which we've incorporated into our religion, we see the Old Testament being here and then they, they drop their gills and slits and fins. This, he's, he's comparing it to evolution. He's saying that we've incorporated evolution into our thought processes of the Bible. And after bearing legs and walking upright, our ancestors soon progressed, you know, then to Nebraska man and then Cro-Magnum and then the Neanderthal. I'm sorry, I'm confusing you here, but he's, he's explaining things. Um, theologically, our ancestors did the same thing. Our Old Testament ancestors bore the burden of the Sabbath. So this is how, this is how we are in our Greek thinking incorporated into our religion is that... Our ancestors had the Sabbath over here and the feast days. And the food laws. So kosher, kosher foods. This is how this is how our Greek mindset has been incorporated into our religion. That this is the past, this is the Old Testament, the Sabbath, the feast days, kosher foods. This is what Brad is saying here. You know, um, they were subject to primitive food laws and old hygiene rules. Without modern technology, they were unable to shave and were forced to wear beards and could not mix their linens um, because there was laws on those things. Unable to fend for themselves, they were forced to live and travel together, but they evolved. And they soon cast aside primitive prohibitions and backward regulations. They shed their Sabbaths and festivals and dietary laws, and they cut their beards and bands and ancient Neanderthal fathers and took upon new celebrations and rest days and eating habits. Finally arriving, so at the Christian man. So this is Christian man today, you know. So this is New Testament, okay? So we're over here we have a whole new set of things. We have Sunday, we have Christmas, we have Easter, okay? We have the ability to eat unclean, so we can eat pigs, eat pig and unclean animals. 
So do you see how our Greek way of thinking has been incorporated into religion? We see it as a timeline, and we think that God thinks that way, but God doesn't think that way. God thinks in cycles. He thinks in circles. He thinks in a cyclical way of thinking. God didn't start back here in the past with the Old Testament and the Sabbath and the feast days and eating kosher and, you know, ways of, of doing things and the, and the, oh, let's not forget the, you know, the Torah, the law. And so we've incorporated this Greek mindset and think that we, we cross the Messiah and then all of a sudden we have the future and we have the New Testament and we have Sunday and we have Christmas and we have Easter and we have the ability to eat unclean animals. This is, this is a Greek way of thinking. And this is how it's been incorporated into this religion. Hebrew thinking is cyclical. Yahweh reveals his nature and will to man in the yearly cycles, okay, that he get, that he gave, and his peop, that he gave to his people, each generation follows Yahweh, has the same truths revealed to them through obedience to his nature, and he will, to his nature and will that he has placed in the activities of their daily lives. In the very beginning, Yahweh revealed his will through the patriarchs and the fathers. This is why from Adam to Moses, you read of the lives of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Families were accountable to the patriarch. Yah's will from the beginning was passed down through his seed, which is his word. This will become abundantly clear as we go on. The Sabbath, the festivals, the new moon, the harvest, etc. will all cyclical pictures in which Yahweh embedded in his nature. They were yearly and weekly reminders, teaching of the nature of their creator. He will reveal the same truths in diverse and sundry man, in, dif in different manners to each generation. So each generation was supposed to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Each generation was supposed to experience God's ways through following his, his cyclical, um, you know, Sabbaths and feast days and all of this. Each generation was supposed to be the same. It was never supposed to go this way and change and be something different. So if you discard what directs and leads your life, then you end up leading the world in immorality. And you end up seeking skewed pictures of Yahweh's nature in ways that he did not ordain. And he also says, you know, his Torah, in which he had embedded in his nature... And will for man is what directs and leads his people in their daily activities and behavior. So Brad is saying, because we got away from God's commandments and God's ways and God's cyclical feasts, which direct your daily activities and behavior, if you discard those things, then you end up leading the world in immorality. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit more and then we'll, we'll end this, okay? Um, declaring the end from the beginning. This is very important. There is a significant reason why our beloved nation has strayed from her religious roots. It is producing her own and is producing her own fruit, which has led to her national behavior. The focus of this book, right here, The Principle of the Seed, is a fundamental principle established from the beginning, which is the seminal foundation of all God's revelation to us. The beginning generates a simple agricultural principle that we can see by looking outside of our windows. It is a seed. Elohim begins with a little seed. Perhaps you are already familiar with this principle. Perhaps you have been told by many churchmen that if you plant a seed of $1,000 to their ministry, God will return to you $10,000 or $100,000. Perhaps you have been taught that this is how God's seed works in your life. And of course, logically, the ministries that tell you that do not really believe that in principle themselves, for if they needed money and really believed that was true, then they would sow $1,000 into your life so that they would reap hundred thousand dollars because if that was true they wouldn't need your money the scriptural principle of the seed however 
is an agricultural truth given to all of mankind before all of mankind existed. It is the very basis of the words of Isaiah the prophet, Remember the former things of old. For I am Elohim and there is no one else. I am Elohim and there is none like me, declaring the end right out of the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet, do are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Many of us are familiar with this passage as it is read in English. This passage, among many, reveals that part of the nature of Elohim that separates him from man is that he knows the end from the beginning. But in Hebrew, the verse begins this way. So if you transliterate it from Hebrew, it says, declaring out of the beginning the end. So in Hebrew, it doesn't say that God just declares the end right out of the beginning. He says, declaring out of the beginning the end. Excuse me. So if you read this in Hebrew, this says something much more provocative. Could it be that Yahweh means exactly what he says? Could it be that he really did mean that he revealed or declared from the beginning the end? Is it possible then that we could gain valuable insight in the days that we live in by understanding the beginning? And consider this, if we, the people of God of Israel, know that the end is revealed out of the beginning, then who else would guess, would you guess, knows this as well as you and I? That's right. Hasatan, the devil, Satan, the dragon, the beast, and in general, the bad guy, in the end will be his revealing and his demise. And he too knows that this is revealed in the beginning. Now, if, if you were he, if you were Satan, and you were armed with this information, what would you do? If you were Satan and you knew that the end was revealed right out of the beginning, what would you do? I think it would behoove you to keep us all away from the beginning. And this is precisely what he has done. The adversary's most successful technique for the past 2,000 years has been to convince most Christians that the beginning has been done away with and that it is no longer relevant for New Testament believers. In the beginning are revealed the foundation and origin of all things. I would like to be so bold as to say that all scripture theology, all of Yahweh's desire, will, and nature, purpose, and even eschatology are found embedded in the first four chapters of Genesis. Uh, we might start doing our Bible, like, Bible discussions straight from the beginning. We're just going to start with Genesis and go all the way through because it's going to blow your mind what you really may not have seen right there in the very beginning in Genesis. I will take it a step further. I believe that everything is found embodied in the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet or Aleph Bet. It is the word of God which reveals that the universe and everything in it was framed from the word of God. In Hebrews we read, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the words of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do not appear. <clears throat> the purpose of this book is to bring to light a very simple principle, a principle that is brought forth from the beginning and can be operating in our world today can be seen operating in our world today, I'm sorry. The principle that can be verified by simply looking out the window, a revelation from Yahweh from the beginning that is substance and evidence that was experienced and lived every day by the people of Yahweh, the Creator. It is imperative that we begin learning the Word of God from the beginning, for eternal truth is embedded there. You will notice throughout this book that all the Hebrew words that I will use will be taken back to their 
Etymological meanings. Etymology is a word that means the study of a root of a word. This word in Greek is etymon and means true, actual, or real. And it comes from the Hebrew word emet, which means truth. So when we trace the etym etymology of a word, we are studying the truth of the word. Okay? Let me illustrate while I, why I will be using a lot of Hebrew words. Suppose I compare Hebrew words to a river. So this is a great picture of why language and words are so important. And I know this is a long video. You can go back, fast forward, rewind, watch it again. Because uh, it's a lot of information. I realize this is not your short, fun video. But it's uh, imperative. It's imperative for understanding, um, and, and it's also imperative for our future, future discussions as well. Um, so Brad goes on to say, suppose I compare Hebrew words to a river. This is a great illustration, guys. A great river, like many rivers, so we know that rivers begin on a mountain top, on the top of a mountain. And let me just let me just illustrate this for you because sometimes it's better if you see it. Okay. So we have a mountain. Okay. And then we have the water coming down which creates a river. Okay. This is the mountain. This is the river. I hope you can see that. Because once again, Facebook has failed me. I can't see anything. So I hope this video is even still going. But you have the mountain and you have the river. You have this river that's coming down. Begins at the mountaintop where the rain pours down out of heaven. Cascading over the rocks, through the trees. Rushing towards the valleys below. Beginning in a place where there is pure water okay so here the water is pure this is where we get our our spring water from our mountain water from right here this is pure water okay this is like nature's reverse osmosis system the rocks running through the rocks and the water running down the mountain through to the, the very first part of the river. Absolute pure water. You can just drink it right out of there. Rushing water. It's not still. It's still rushing. It's moving very fast. Okay. Beginning at a place in which the water is pure, pristine, and energized. A place where the water is healthy and full of oxygen because it's moving. You know, we know that when you're going to drink water out of a body of water, it has to be moving water. You know, of a rushing uh, brook or river. You don't want to go to a river that is not moving and it's just stale um, because then you can get sick if you drink that water. But as these narrow, clear streams begin to flow through the valleys and become rivers, things begin to change. Remember, he's comparing this to words and language, okay? Things begin to change. Man begins to remove or diminish the life that is in it and begins dumping or adding to everything from animal and human waste, toxic chemicals. So here you have a city and the river is here. And now the river's slowing down, okay? And here's the city. Fog, you know, smoke and so now you have waste going into the river. So now this pure, pristine water is starting to slow down and it's starting to become kind of murky and people are dumping stuff from the city into the water. Eventually the river is oozing into the great lake or ocean and it becomes thick, brown, and undrinkable. So then this river dumps into... 
the ocean. Okay? And at that point, it gets lost. It just gets lost into the ocean, okay? The river started out pure and pristine, but after time eventually becomes polluted and profaned. Remember, we're comparing this to language. Throughout the centuries, words have been changed just like the river. Many of us have been drinking from that river, but not from the mountaintop. We have not been drinking from this part of the, of the language. My focus, Brad's focus in this book, is to bring us back to the mountaintop. And he's got a teaching called Back to the Mountaintop. Uh, let me show you this. It's called Back to the Mountaintop. Words mean things. Back to the mountaintop. And he's he's got a, this is such a great teaching. Like I, I really, really, really encourage you to go to the link in this video and, um, you know, support his ministry by purchasing this video or this book that I'm reading to you today. Um, because this is, this is going to, he explains everything. So I, I'm not good at explaining as well as he is, but he, he breaks it down very simply for you to understand. But it's called Back to the Mountaintop. In fact, I'm probably going to be giving one of these away. We're probably going to do a video giveaway here soon, maybe uh, probably this week, um, where someone will win uh, this video here, this teachings. So he says here, throughout the centuries, words have been changed just like this river. Many of us have been drinking from that river, but not from the mountaintop. And his focus is to bring us back to the mountain duck and drink from words as they are revealed from at the beginning. What he's saying is, in Hebrew, you take words back to their original meaning, their, their very simplified original meaning, instead of this complex abstract meaning that we have way down here. So up here at the mountaintop, words are simple. Words are simple and pure the water is pure and down here in this part of the river words are abstract and hard to understand you will notice when beginning at the beginning so at the beginning of the Bible that Yahweh first brings forth the heaven the earth, the waters, the vegetation, the trees, the fruit, the grass, the herbs, the seeds. And the Apostle Paul told us that the natural comes first and then the spiritual. He says that in 1 Corinthians 15, 46. The Creator's first revelation to us is found in the creation of things that you and I can look outside our window and see, touch, taste, smell, and hear. Elohim did not begin his creation with man. He begins with what we call nature. Why is man the epitome of Elohim's creative act? Not the first thing out of that he created? Because man is endowed with choice. I believe that the creator began with dirt and trees and flowers and seeds because that part of his creation was not infused with choice. Agricultural life is not afforded the opportunity to get up in the morning and tell God that they're not going to produce any fruit today. Non-human life operates and obeys Yahweh by instinct. It is subject to this law, but reproduces and bears fruit naturally. According to the psalmist, the trees in the field clap their hands by design. And the heavens constantly declare the glory of God. That's what the word of God says. We know that. Our omniscient, our omniscient creator embedded his essence, his will, his teachings, his prophecies, his truth in the natural things in the beginning. Knowing that the same truth that spoke to man 6,000 years ago would speak to us in the 21st century today. Because God is smart. God foreknew that man would fall. And given the choice, would exchange the Creator's word for his own word and produce his own fruit. The Creator knew that man would consume the fruit of the other tree. 
and produce his own feasts, his own Sabbaths, his own diet, his own languages, his own doctrines, and his own ways. So Yahweh, in an awesome display of his omniscience, planted his word in plants, trees, grass, and seeds. The root of the seed of most Hebrew words are found in the original action that is based on the activities of everyday lives of Yahweh's people. And this is an important concept to get into your thought process. Religions over the centuries have taken simple concepts found in everyday life and turned them into systematic theologies and complicated pinhead, pinheaded intellectual pursuits. So again, we went from a Hebrew mindset of thinking of the scriptures and, and turned them into systematic theologies and intellectual pursuits into this Greek way of thinking. The end result has been a vast array of religious litmus tests that could, that few could satisfy. I believe that if Yeshua were walking around us today, he would tell us that if we wanted to understand the basis for what is right and wrong, good and bad, clean and unclean, created or evolutionary, just look outside the window. What do you see happening, happening in the natural? Do you see frogs turning into princes, birds dropping their wings and standing upright, tadpoles turning into turtles, humans losing their gills? What you see is what Elohim revealed from the beginning. You see like kind producing like kind. No one has to take you back in their imagination four million years ago in order to understand how life operates. Evolution, which I liken to in many ways to modern religious theology, is contradicted by the world outside our window in every way, in everyday life. Yahweh has drawn us a picture in the beginning of where all scriptural theology is found. It is a simple picture that every child from every nation draws when you sit down with a crayon and a piece of construction paper. It's a picture of a house, a family, and a piece of land. Yes, I am suggesting to you, and Brad is suggesting to you in this book, that it is just that simple. Everything goes back to those very sim those three simple things. Um, and let me just end with this. <clears throat> let me just end with this right here. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. That's going to take too long. Let me just end with this. So the seed, the most fundamental agricultural principle is found in the very first chapter of Bereshit, which is Genesis in Hebrew. It is the principle of the seed, a principle that begins where it should in the beginning. And is found scattered, a seed that's scattered throughout scripture from beginning to end. Elohim from the beginning presents us a very simple truth. A law, if you will. Our scriptures begin with three natural empirical truths in the beginning. Remember, where is the end located? In the beginning. In Genesis 1, 11 through 12, Elohim said... Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit yielding and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in himself upon the earth. And it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in himself after his kind. And then he saw that it was good. Notice that the seed multiplies after his kind and that the seed is in himself. Could it be that something far more profound than just plants and trees is being suggested here? So here's the law of the seeds. In any high school or junior high textbook, you will find three laws of cells. The first states that all living things are made up of cells and the products of those cells. The second law says that new cells come from other living cells and the third law states that all cells carry out their own life functions. 
Three natural truths of creation are revealed here in the opening chapter of Genesis, which are pictures and patterns of the unseen spiritual realities. These same three natural laws in creation are a seed is used by Yahweh to express how all living things produce and reproduce. Number two, like kind produces like kind. And number three, the seed is in the fruit. <clears throat> Let's see here. I don't want to, I don't want to drag on for you. This is almost two hour long video. I want to summarize. Um, okay. Remember the verse in Isaiah? Think about it. How many parables contain harvests, wheat, tares, sowing, reaping, fruit, and vineyards? How many contain brides and bridegrooms and marriages? How many refer to fathers, sons, children, brothers? Keep in mind that seeds are the expression of how things grow and how animals and people reproduce. Right after the events of creation, we are told about two trees in the Garden of Eden. How do trees start? From seeds. The Garden of Eden is soon followed by the fall of Adam and the revelation of the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Two seeds that are at enmity with one another. When we first learn of <clears throat> human accounts in the scriptures, we learn of the stark differences between Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Yeshua and Barabbas, Messiah and Anti-Messiah. The pattern of the seed were bear fruit everywhere throughout the rest of scripture. Okay. Let's get to the very last part of this, this chapter here. Bear with me one second. Um... I'm just going to stop there. I'm just going to stop right there. I apologize for the long-windedness, but um, I just wanted to give you a little preview uh, regarding this book, um, and, and maybe I can go over some of it at a later date. Um, but we're run over way past time here, so I just want to kind of close with a few things. So... We can see from what we've talked about today that the Greek mindset has played a role in how we view the scriptures, um, how we view our world, and it even has, and how we view medicine. It's, it, it's in our, our medical system, okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to try to see these differences in the Hebrew mindset and in the Greek mindset so that you can better understand your scriptures and, and how you view the world. It's important. I'm not saying that you have, this is no way saying that you have to become a Hebrew scholar. No, but you have to, you want to understand it from a Hebrew mindset, the word, which might include learning a little bit of Hebrew and, and some of the root words and meanings. Um, but Brad does a really, 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 really good job in this video called Words Mean Things, Back to the Mountaintop. And, um, and it's very simple. I promise you, you don't have to be an intellectual studying type of person to understand what he's saying in these videos. He breaks it down very simply for you. And um, I'm going to do a, a giveaway. Um, once I have it, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to give away this uh, this this group of these are CDs of teachings. Um, 
because I really think that you'll you'll benefit from it. If you want to go ahead and purchase these teachings in this book, um, this book as well, the principle of the seed, and back to the mountaintop, um, just go on the link in this video at Wild Branch Ministries. That's Brad's ministry, and you know you can purchase his uh, his videos or his books there. He all of his teachings are really good, but these are the ones I wanted to kind of bring forth today and and kind of introduce you to. Um, stay tuned because I, I will be giving this one away. I will, I'll be giving away these videos here. The And, and it breaks down everything. It, it breaks down everything. Very simple for you. And I, I, I just wanted to kind of scratch the surface today. I know it seemed like a lot of information. Um, and maybe if you just got a little teeny tiny bit today and understood any of it, um, then then it was worth it. Worth it two hours of your time watching this. Um, uh, thank you for being here. I will, um, I will keep you posted on when we'll do maybe a drawing or some sort of contest to figure out a winner for, for the videos, uh, like we've done in the past with book giveaways. And, um, and, and then, it, like I said, if you want to go ahead and purchase them, just go to the link in this video description and you can just go to his website and purchase the book one of his books or his teachings. Um, I hope you'll be with me next Shabbat. Um, I love you. I pray for you. And uh, I hope to see you next Shabbat. Um, and I hope this week you will, you, you'll, you'll question, you know, you'll question the way you've been viewing your scriptures. And you'll question, you know, someone brought up the, someone brought up the, what, one of, one of the parts of the New Testament that says that the Hebrew, that the Holy Spirit is going to, to teach you all things. And the te the Holy Spirit is going to, is, is, is the only thing that's going to reveal, uh, reveal scriptures, the truth of the scriptures to you. And it's unfortunate that, um, that you want to see it that way, because what that, wh when you say that, basically what that's saying is, is I don't want to look at things from a Hebrew mindset. I just want the Holy Spirit to reveal things to me. And it's just, it's kind of a cop out, but that's okay. You don't have to. We were given, we were all given a, uh, a free will. We, we don't even have to serve God. That's how much free will we have. So you definitely don't even have to, um, you know, learn things from a Hebrew mindset or study from a Hebrew mindset. This video was just to introduce these subjects and hopefully inspire some of you to to dig a little deeper because um like i've said before this page keys to the kingdom i didn't i didn't create this page f for the unsaved although I, I welcome those people to come here you're more than welcome to come here and learn or to discuss the bible and read the word together um but it, i i didn't have that in mind when when i started uh and created keys to the kingdom it wasn't for um from the mindset of wanting to go to the unsaved person it was to go to those who are already established believers or maybe baby believers and help them in their walk um or those who are mature believers and help them to go and look at things um from a different perspective that they probably haven't looked at before in ways that they haven't probably looked at the word before. So um, that's all. That was the whole purpose of this video. I hope that some of you will take just a little bit of this two hour long winded video and um, maybe learn something from it and maybe go and, and, and search some of this out. Maybe go and purchase some of Brad Scott's books or teachings because he is an absolute blessing uh, to the body of Messiah. And his teachings are um, are, um, such, they have such value. They have such value. And I hope that you will be inspired to look those things up or learn from him. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and end this video now. Um, thank you for being here. Shabbat Shalom. And we'll see you next Shabbat. God bless you.